Um, next, we'll be proceeding uh, forward to the panel discussion uh, entitled Sri Lanka's Ethnocratic Land Grabs, Methods, Consequences, and Tamil Land Defense. Um, it is my pleasure to warmly welcome the moderator of this panel, Mr. Lorenzo Fiorito. Mr. Lorenzo Fiorito holds a Master of Laws degree in International Dispute Resolution. He has been active on Tamil issues as a writer and activist since 2011 in Canada, in Switzerland, and in the UK. He believes strongly in self-determination for the Tamil nation and accountability for Sri Lanka's genocide. Without further ado, Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Abarami. Um, Wanakam, hello everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, and in particular, thanks to Justice Dignesterin for your kind words and to the Honorable uh, Mr. Sampanthan for hosting uh, this documentary premiere alongside him. Uh, our discussion is entitled uh, Sri Lanka's Ethnocratic Land Grabs, Methods, Consequences, and Tamil Land Defense. Uh, due to uh, an emergency, uh, Anurad Mitchell has had to leave, and as well, uh, you've seen uh, from Dr. Patkar. So this will be a conversation with Professor Ramu Manivanan, who I'll introduce now. Uh, Professor Manivanan is the director of the Multiversity Center for Indigenous Knowledge Systems in Tamil Nadu, India. He is visiting professor at the Department of International Relations at Royal College Autonomous at the University of Madras. And in, a, in addition to a distinguished academic career that has taken him to universities in Tokyo, Passau, Germany, Paris, and Taipei, he has worked with refugee communities from Tibet, Burma, and the island of Sri Lanka. Professor Manivanan is a teacher, social activist, whose publications include Sri Lanka, Hiding the Elephant, Documenting Genocide, War Crimes, and Crimes Against Humanity. Thank you, Professor Manivanan, for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lorenzo, and respected, uh, respected Justice C. V. Vigneshwaran, and other distinguished panelists and members of the audience, and ladies and gentlemen. In in relate in relation to the land issues, and I, I would like to make a very brief political point, and. Uh, I would like to raise this concern about this land question is uh, in, inextricably linked to the um, cultural culture, identity, and uh, the sovereign rights of the Tamil people. In fact, the land question is central to the ethnic crisis in, in Sri Lanka. The land rights of Tamils in North and East has continuously been under thrust and shrunk consistently since the beginning of 1950s in the name of irrigation and development projects combined with Sinhala settlements. During the period of three decades of civil war and emphatically after the end of brutal war, military resolution in May 2009, land rights has completely been disregarded and abused by the Sri Lankan government and military authorities with military occupying more than 70 to 80,000 acres of land in North alone and with steady demographic alterations underway in the East. Besides the military camps, the army officially runs, as we heard from other panel members and the, and the field and the documentary that has been uh, shown this evening, and the luxury resorts and the golf courses have been erected on land seized from the displaced people. And it, it has been a very systemic and orchestrated, state orchestrated Sinhala settlements and colonization of the North and East, which is still continuing with much more force and with the displacements, including the repressive measures such as detentions, physical and psychological torture, disappearances of young men and women, and harassments. With all this, like on the other hand, that we, we are noticing the huge settlement of the Sinhala business and housing projects meant for security forces and the sudden burst in the building of Buddhist viharas in Tamil areas and the growing Sinhala settlements along the coasts of Mulaitiva districts and around Nagadipa, Mahabiharaya and Jaffna districts. All, all this clearly bad testimony to this, the argument that land is central to the ethnic crisis in, in, in Sri Lanka. 
And in the process, like given the fact that the 30 years of civil war and the brutal resolution of the ethnic conflict in 2009 has not resulted in restoration of peace and stability in Sri Lanka. On the other hand, the military means to resolution of the ethnic conflict has given rise to several challenges, including the accountability issues concerning the state and government of Sri Lanka, as well as the consolidation of the ethnocentric authoritarian based polity. The United Nations Human Rights Council resolutions in 2012, 13, 14 and 21 reveal the institutional responses and structural shortcomings, global challenges and political realities and which are governing the transitional, the question of transitional justice. And I would, I would like to raise this a very simple and basic concern to the distinguished audience here, even while talking about the, the transitional justice, the four pillars of transitional justice, the right to know and right to justice and right to reparations and guarantees of non-recurrence. In all this and much more, or even much less, I would say, that the Sri Lankan government has conscientiously denied its engagement and denied itself of any due process. Now, the question is in terms of the land, which is very central about like in the right of victims to reparations and the duty of the state to provide a comprehensive reparation policy and programs, which involves establishment of recognition of office for reparations of re return of land to civilian owners, which has not happened, or even in terms of such identification or certification of absence to families of missing persons. Now, the question is that in, in, in politics and law and politics and international law is that like, you know, in defining the characteristics of the state, whether in terms of population, territory and sovereignty and government, if you take all this book, the four basic criteria which defines the role of the state and Sri Lanka, the government of Sri Lanka has been ruling the northern east without the consent of the people. I mean, that implies that without the sovereign consent of the masses, the Tamil masses, and there is no government. And if there is a government, and you would not find that what we witness in case of the Northern East, the land, the land question. And then like in territorial, uh, defining the territorial is that it is a very clearly defined aspect is that like, uh, and there is a, a trapped nation. The Tamil nation is, is trapped inside the, uh, the Sinhala country, the so-called the Sinhala country, the Tamil nation is trapped inside and which has been acknowledged by the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord in 1987, and which has been referred by the uh, Honorable Justice uh, C.B. Vigneshwaran in his uh, address, and as well as in the second case in 2002, and with the, the peace process between the government of Sri Lanka and the liberation tigers of the Tamil Elam, that the territorial aspect has also been clearly recognized. But after the war, in in terms of that, like, you know, the, uh, the shrinking, the land, the mass area, the content is that we, we are in fact witnessing a multiple uh, genocide. It is not a genocide of uh, ethnic genocide or structural, cultural genocide. It's a multiple uh, genocide that we are noticing here with uh, continuous demographic shifts. And in fact, there is a, a threat to survival. And uh, with all these uh, questions, like, you know, what, how can we address a, a very fundamental political question is that, and the land is connected not only to culture, identity, the rights, the human rights question, and access to life and livelihood issues, but the political economy, the political economy is that, that the, the political economy is not is, uh, uh, inclusive of the people who own this land. This is a very serious question. This is a very, very serious concern to the uh, national or the, the national, the people in the northern east of Sri Lanka, the people in the world as well. And then, uh, in, in fact, like, you know, it, uh, now it's time that we, uh, we there's a need for concerted effort is required both at home and abroad, and which uh, including the inter international institutions. Uh, which the UN and the human rights organizations, uh, organizations around the world to draw the attention of the world. I mean, like, you know, if you're talking about land, 
if you're talking about culture, identity in terms of like livelihood issues and then the political economy. And um, so should we now go to the UN rapporteurs? Uh, should we bring this to the UN rapporteurs that attention or should we just draw the attention of the Human Rights Council or the inter other international organizations? Or should we just also act simultaneously at, as, as part of the national, um, the public? And so I think like, you know, there has to be a very um, multiple efforts and and, when peop and what really is a very um, a paradoxical is that uh, the internal uh, colonialism and which, in which includes of the indigenous the rights of the indigenous people the Sri Lankan military is selling milk and like conducting tours and doing farming and selling the agricultural producers in the Tamil market. And like, you know, um, I'm, I would like to remind, I would like to call about the 1960s, the civil rights movement in the United States. One of the early instances of the success of the civil rights movement in the United States is that like, you know, the, 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 the local population and uh, the community, the Afro-American community, community boycotted they completely boycotted the uh, the shops the uh, the various other economic activities which are services provided by the uh, the uh, the white majority the the white uh, the white population so in terms of here this is not the dialogue the discourse is not between the the tamils and the sinhalese but in terms of the completely the economy which is controlled by the the militarized uh, the state apparatus is that there has to be some kind of uh, a civil uh, resistance, civil and political resistance in terms of like, um, how do we address this and in a much collective way? And uh, I, I, again, I say that you know, this ha there has to be a concerted effort, both at home and abroad with the, uh, because uh, this is a national question as well as involved. And there's a national question is involved because of the ethnic factor. There's an eth ethnicity, eth ethnocentric policies of the Sri Lankan government. And at the same time, the right to resist, the right to seek demand, the right to seek a political resolution rests with the people. And uh, with all the odds against the population, the people, the territory. And I, I still believe that, like, you know, uh, the political space and then the uh, economic uh, solutions and like when people are talking about the pandemic in around all over the world and I do I, I have witnessed myself personally and I have all the rights to say this that the people in the northern east of Sri Lanka have lived for more than 30 years and more than 40 years and to, to take that from the 1980s 40 years and in in the pandemic situation that what we are talking about like you know isolation and the pandemic uh, the politics of the governments is imposing restrictions. This has prevailed for too long and for more than four decades. Now it's time to kind of address this at the both at the national and at the international level. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Mani uh, for that excellent intervention. Uh, so um, the, the audience is welcome to uh, send some questions into the uh, question and answer. Uh, I have uh, one or two prepared questions uh, for you, Professor. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to uh, open by uh, identifying two strands in what you said uh, in terms of being able to combat land grabs. First of all, you mentioned social movements, and in the second place, you mentioned economic pressure. So uh, first of all, uh, what do you think are the most effective methods to reverse land grabs and return these properties to the rightful owners? And the second place, uh, what role do you see for international economic organizations, such as, for example, the World Bank? Yes. So, th thank you very much. And the first thing is about when you talk about the uh, the the uh, it, from 2009, and uh, the the Tamil the Tamil people, and then the diaspora and the Human Rights Council. We are talking about the. Uh, in terms of like you know accountability mechanism to be enforced and to have the process to be initiated against Sri Lanka purely on the war crimes and crimes against humanity but like you know much less on the um, the starvation that has been imposed and on the uh, general public for more than three decades the, it, it's a virtual uh, denial and deprivation of access to food and access to agricultural lands and ac access to all kinds of employment opportunities. And now after the war, if the Sri Lankan government or the military itself 
he is like you know um, taking over the lands and then cultivating food and selling milk and selling uh, butter selling um, what you call as a curd and then like conducting pleasure tourism and like you know the completely it's it's a, it's, it's a big quest this uh, uh, any kind of access to life not only to land and like you know uh, where, where should these people go in their own land so you drive them out of the land and you drive them out of the livelihood opportunities and no fishing no farming no no kind of so who should how how could they even become a consumer in that society and this kind of um, impoverishment on the other hand like you know i think about this is a right uh, step to take this particular um, the political economy the deprivation denial deprivation and the distortion of the lives and this is a forced starter forced starvation this is not only happened in the during the war in 2007 to 9 by like creating a so called no war zone and denying food and access and medicine this has been uh, when was the food and medicine and access to medicine was given to the north and east in the last 30 years so i think uh, we we should we not only should speak about like you know the war crimes and crimes against humanity or the genocide and committed by the sri lankan state but we should also talk about the food rights the right to food the right to livelihood and right to land these are interrelated subjects and with the growing uh, with the growing uh, kind of disappearances of the tamil land like you know that means we are pr- we are placing more people under a greater stress and greater starvation and uh, so i i think like you know what is happening in the southern and the central part of sri lanka in terms of food crisis and people standing in line but this has been happening for 30 and 40 years in the north and east without people standing in line because they cannot come out to stand in line so i think internationalization of this particular crisis is very important and then the the tamil population the tamil people in the north and east should able to call like you know should draw certain inspiration should draw certain lessons from the civil rights movements in the united states about like you know choosing to consume what is right and choosing to buy from places what where you have to do and i think this that there is there's a need to strike at the state the sri lankan state at this point economically too uh thank you very much for that answer uh so i have a a second question prepared and uh after your answer i'll turn it over to the moderator for our uh our next uh um our next act um so uh i wanted to ask you uh, you are a, a well respected professor in uh, the field of international international relations and politics Uh, you you may have read that uh, president gotabaya rajapaksa of uh, sri lanka has offered negotiations with the tamil diaspora uh, a move that may be considered unprecedented in peace time um, and he made this promise to un secretary general guterres uh what is your opinion of this invitation and what is your opinion as to whether settlement of land claims could figure into any such discussion perhaps with the uh, international community and elected tamil leaders cooperating thank you and uh, the my first impression about when he said that body is willing to engage the uh, the diaspora community is that like you know um, it's the tamil diaspora's economic power and it's the tamil diaspora's economic power and it is the uh, the uh, a completely uh, struggling economy in in sri lanka so like you know if you connect these two aspects is that like you know if you uh, then the third point i would ref- refer to is the um, in in 2015 when there was a transition change in power and like you know the the there's a certain sections in diaspora thought about rehabilitation and then like you know investing in sri lanka so like you know this is a, a, this is a time that you know when the sri lankan president offers it's not a truce certainly not a truce and then like he, uh, and when he talks about like you know engaging this is a pure a step towards like you know deceiving the tamil um, population and the diaspora into an economic engagement and the second aspect is that the international community should also consider that particularly the tamil diaspora should in fact like you know join hands with the national population to place conditions and like you know the accountability mechanism 
and then to uh, to take up certain issues which are long pending if the, if the sri lankan establishment is is prepared to address those issues and the diaspora should be ready to engage with the sri lankan state and what should restrict them they have a stake in the uh, transition stake in justice in sri lanka so like you know the preparation the, it, it's conditional it's a conditional so whatever the sri lankan state has a condition to engage the diaspora the diaspora should have a and uh, should I, should I have a task to engage the pre sri lankan president but my impression is that it is a pure a step towards an economic um, recovery for the sri lankan state it's it's a deception thank you very much professor manivanan for that excellent answer